Welcome back to Soccer Card United, it's episode 215 of the greatest soccer card podcast in the world. My name is Jason, and uh, tonight, today, there's no Enzo. It's a solo show for me, so uh, if you want to just go ahead and click off the the episode now, Enzo is back on Thursday for episode 216. Um, if not, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about the F1 event that we went to last weekend. Um the new uh, hobby media organization collect media and then a couple of football stories which you can stick around for too if you like um but uh you know i won't be offended if you just go ahead and click off now because tonight uh i should say i keep saying tonight because it's late when i'm recording this i'm recording this late um for the listeners you uh you're lucky um, because the viewers are just seeing my giant face you see my giant, I'm zoomed all the way in on my face. Um, I have no uh, lights on in my room, just the horrible uh, white glare, uh, the kind of blue, bluey white glare of my computer monitors. Um, all I have for company is the reflection of my computer um, in my glasses, my Chicago Cubs hat, and and you uh dear listener so i would recommend if you're watching this i'll just look in the camera for a second if you're watching this this would be a great you can't even see my okay there we go if you're watching this uh, feel free to um just listen to this episode maybe just click off the tab or open it on spotify or something because this is very intimate what we're doing this is extremely intimate um i i think you'd be a lot more comfortable if we didn't have to kind of, you know, don't look at my, I didn't put any makeup on. I'm in kind of, you know, at least 720p. So it's, it's not good. I, I realized that, but um, anyway, so Enzo's in Madrid. Um, I believe he's going to see Manchester City uh, play Real Madrid at the Bernabeu uh, tomorrow night. But if he does, uh, he can tell us all about that on Thursday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we were in England last Friday, um, at a Tops F1 event. So Tops had had this event, we talked about it before, um, where they were having uh, people over to Silverstone, which I guess is the home of British motorsport. Uh, it's where the British uh, Grand Prix is. And um, it was like this kind of like invite. Uh, some people got invitations. A couple, for, you know, a couple of people got invitations. Um, some people uh, won a raffle. And then there was us, and we were we were snuck in by one of the raffle winners uh, who won tickets, uh, Momo Lass, um, who was very, very kind uh, to share his tickets with us. And we, we inquired as to whether or not we could go under his name, and that was deemed to be okay. Um, so there we were, and um, it was a very interesting event. It was very cool. It was like, so we had kind of the Silverstone Museum uh, was open after hours for the event, and you could walk around and look at all the exhibits, obviously, without, you know, the general public there. Well, thank God. Um, and then there was like a dinner and there was, you know, drinks and all that kind of stuff. And um, a couple of very exciting things happened. One was that there was a product announcement. So um, the F1 brand team for Tops were there and they announced that we were getting two new F1 hobby products this year. So one was... Uh, paddock one is paddock pass which is um is um their version of stadium club so it's going to be you know I, I assume it's gonna be candid photos and that kind of thing um then we're also getting a, a finest an f1 finest um now obviously the instant question that comes up with finest is is it going to be an auto per mini box i think I don't know if this was confirmed tonight. I'm pretty sure it's going to be an auto per master box, but we did hear that everything, including release dates, we heard like kind of like uh, July, August, September kind of time for releases and stuff like that. But we did hear that whether it be the configuration of the boxes, the exact makeup, the cards themselves, whatever the date release date, it's all uh, to be confirmed. The only thing they can confirm at this stage is that those two products are coming this year. Um, so that was very exciting. And then, um, Jessica Hawkins, who is a driver ambassador for Aston Martin and a test driver and a stunt driver and all sorts of stuff. 
uh, she came out and she did like an interview, um, which was very, uh, very, very interesting. And then she was kind of presented with this F1 card. Um, and she's the first uh, female driver to be getting a top F1 card. So it was very nice. And there was a break. There was a Sapphire break and a Chrome break. And we got, um, Enzo got the pick of the bunch. He got an of 25 Sapphire uh, of an F2 driver. We got a great gif of Enzo celebrating that. Um, very exciting. And um, yeah, it was good fun. It was good fun, I have to say. Um, you can see, there we are. Look, um, we went to the old uh, the old uh, Silverstone mega shop and got a couple of F1 jackets. I'm going to just give you a little peek behind the curtain there. They We did not bring those jackets. When we traveled from Ireland, we were not wearing those F1 jackets. We got them. Uh, to look the part, as they say. And I like to think that we've done a an okay job there. Um, and this is the, the kind of the breaking news. We got to do the breaking news. Um, so, yeah, very, uh, very exciting stuff. That was good fun. I'm sure um, if Enzo listens to this, or even if he doesn't listen to this, he's going to come back on Thursday and have all sorts of additional details to tell you, um, which I either don't want to go into now or forget. So, anyway... And we may talk more about that on Thursday, but it's really cool. I love to see these kind of events going on. Um, I I just think that's like such a good way to grow the hobby. And yeah, the more the merrier when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, So if I'd like to know what people think of these events, though, like obviously, you know, we we were kind of the exception. We're the only people that kind of came in from outside the UK. Um, Momo last reached out and was like, are you guys close to Silverstone? And we were like, I don't kind of. I guess we can fly. It's a short flight to Birmingham or to Luton, and then we can we can go. We can uh, head over there. Um, so we were just kind of lucky enough that we didn't have anything on our schedule, and we were able to, to kind of last minute go. Um, obviously it would be different. You know, if if there's um if there's kind of scheduling conflicts or people can't go, but like in general, I think these are a great event. These are a great a great idea. These are a great. These are in general, I think these are a great event. No. These are a great idea. Um, I'm talking too much because Enzo's not here. Usually he's here to interrupt me and I can gather my thoughts. Um, okay, listen, I heard Darren Rovell, the uh, collectibles journalist, maybe the only serious collectibles journalist, serious as in taken seriously by the, the mainstream media um, out there. Um, I heard him on Sports Card Nonsense earlier with Mike and Jesse talking about uh, Collect Media, which is his new media company for the hobby that we talked about recently and they launched their site so that was today april 8th was their uh, launch day so let's go and have a look at the hobby's latest media venture so nice uh nice website here i would say this design probably inspired by the athletic maybe it's very kind of like the athletic and um, also kind of a new media sports uh, journalism uh, company um what do you got here? So we have auctions. So you have your uh, your auction news uh, cards. I'm confused about what these tabs are. I guess as they add more content, it'll be needs to be you know uh, segmented more and more. Autographs, the top ten most valuable rarest autographs. By the way, it's not an ad for Collect Media. I'm just. Stephen Hawking, <laughs> okay, uh, right, uh, tickets, yeah, game one, so this isn't, oh, I see what's happening, sorry, so auctions, trading cards, autographs, tickets, and game one, these are all different collectible uh, categories, so these are, it's not just for sports cards, This it's for uh, collectibles in general, and then we have your news section down here, um, a Mickey Mantle type one photo sells for record Eight hundred and forty-three, seven hundred and fifty, eight hundred forty-three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars at auction. A Type One photo record. What's a Type One photo? What's a Type One? Um, Type Ones are considered first-generation photographs, meaning they were developed from the original negative within two years of when the picture was taken. Okay, interesting. Um. Marabilia Thief details heist in 60 minutes interview. Meet the man who believe who always believe in the world's most expensive comic book. It's very interesting stuff. Um very interesting stuff indeed. 
So I, I heard Darren Ravel on Sports Card Nonsense. I, I, I guess he'd been making the rounds not just on um, kind of hobby media, but also like he was on CNBC. You see him in you know, I don't know, the likes of Business Week, Bloomberg. Is that these are the kind of places you'd see him? I don't know. Um, but yeah, he's been talking ESPN, maybe. I don't know. But uh, he's been doing the rounds because uh, he's kind of a known figure and uh, plugging this thing. They have a, apparently an office in Times Square. They got $4 million behind them. And last night, they broke a story on a record-setting $250,000 Connor McDavid jersey sale. Only Wayne Gretzky's NHL jerseys have sold for hire. That's Will Stern, who's also on the Collect uh, team. I see them there uh, on something called Collect TV or Cook TV. Um, anyway, I think this is good. I, I, I like to see more hobby media, as I said before. And the big test for them is whether or not they, they uh, do enough soccer stuff. That's my big test. Maybe I'll write in. Maybe is there a letters to the editor section? Let me check the website. Is there a letters to the editor? Contact us, I guess, is, is the... If you have a story we should be aware of or something we got wrong, drop us an email. Want to tell us about your collection or your hunt for that one collectible? Tell us your stories. They might just end up in our coverage. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Okay. So I guess everyone can email collect and say, soccer cards. Talk about talk about it. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's move on to a couple of football stories. I don't know if you saw um, Athletic Bilbao. Athletic Club Bilbao won their first Copa del Rey um, in forty years the other night um, against uh, Real Mallorca. Um, or CD Mallorca. I guess no one calls them. Yeah, Real Mallorca. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I doubt myself there. Um, yeah, they won. Um, uh, Atletico Bilbao won on penos. Um, actually, they had to come back because uh, Mallorca went up uh, one 0 up, and and, and uh, they had to come back uh, through Oyen Sanset, who's a very exciting attacking midfielder. Um, Ernesto Valverde is their coach. Definitely, probably, definitely, probably. Wow, I'm really on form tonight. Definitely, probably. Um, the greatest coach, or maybe the second greatest coach in Athletic Club Bilbao history, uh, Ernesto Valverde. You may remember him from his time at uh, Barcelona, um, which is a tragedy, really, because you, sh- you should know him from his time at um, Athletic Bilbao. Anyway, so uh, they won 4 2 on penalties. Mallorca kind of crumbled in the penalty shootout, but, you know. Uh, listen to this. This is a brilliant article by Sid Lowe. Uh, it was at the uh, Stadio La Cartuja in uh, Seville. And Sid Lowe, in his Guardian report on the uh, match, he's a brilliant guy, uh, writer, that guy. 40 years and it all came down to a single kick. At 10 to 1 in the morning in Seville, Alex Berenguer stood by the penalty spot, handed one shot, one opportunity to seize everything they ever wanted. Across four decades and five consecutive defeated finals, Athletic Club had never been closer had been close, but never as close as this, and they were not going to let go, not now. Berenguer skipped to one side, ran towards the ball, smashed it into the bottom corner of the net, and just kept on running, over the advertising boards, across the track, and towards the thousands and thousands of fans, celebrating their first major trophy in a generation. Now listen, I'm not going to read you the whole article, but I highly recommend you go and read Sidlo on the Copa del Rey. Uh, final, of course, one of the great subplots of the Bell over the last few years has been in Yaki Williams and his younger brother, Nico Williams, um, and their brilliant story um, of uh, of coming to the Basque country and, uh, you know, um, being icons there. Um, and there was great images, I don't know if you saw these, um, of the two celebrating afterwards um, and just, you know, kind of embracing each other. I mean, imagine what that would be like to celebrate with your brother after winning the first Copa del Rey for the club in 40 years. Um, wow, pretty incredible moment. Um, I have to say that before the emergence of Nico Williams, I kind of considered Inaki Williams to be a kind of a great, loyal servant to Atleti Bilbao, but sort of like he couldn't hit a barn door. And and the emergence of Nico Williams and playing with his brother and, and getting a little bit older as well and kind of um, being one of the senior men in the club, um, obviously has a great you know record of, of staying power and appearances and all that stuff and famously never missed a game for ages and ages and ages. Um, but since his brother has kind of burst onto the scene and he gets to play with Nico, I have to say Inyaki is not the same player um, as he was uh, when I kind of watched him, you know, three three years ago or four years ago. 
Um, he had kind of he had burst onto the scene himself. He had established kind of what player he was, his finishing and his end product was always in question. And it kind of just looked like he was going to maybe, you know, score seven or eight goals a season for, you know, a few years and then maybe leave the club or not be able to compete at the highest level. Um, but Athletic, who were obviously limited in their recruitment um, and obviously saw something in him that I didn't see being the uh, feeble-minded, uh, fickle, uh, facile individual that I am. Um, but then with Nico coming, he just kind of seemed, and the return of Ernesto Valverde, he just seemed kind of uh, reborn. Um, so it's very, very happy for Iñaki Williams because I, I watched him kind of um, scuff a lot of chances and kind of huff and puff for a long time and do a lot of good running, but never really get there. And it's just a, it's a fantastic club, Athletic Bilbao. Um, it's a lovely stadium. Sam Mamez, it was also full. Uh, obviously, the game was in Seville, but Sam Mamez was full. They were all watching it on the TV screen in Bilbao and uh, seemed to be having a great time. Uh, I'd recommend going to watch a match in Bilbao if you ever got a chance. Um. I tell you what, let's just finish up here. I'm sure you're absolutely sick and tired of me. Uh, let's finish up here by just previewing very quickly. I'll just use this as kind of jumping off point to talk about some football stories. Um, the uh, the European quarterfinals that are coming. So um, this is uh, tomorrow, Tuesday. We have Arsenal hosting Bayern Munich at the Emirates for their first leg of the Champions League uh, quarterfinal. Obviously, they got beaten in 2017, 5-1, home and away by Bayern. And in 2015, got beaten 5-1 in the away leg. And even though they beat Bayern in the uh, the home leg. But three consecutive defeats, 5-1 in the Champions League by Bayern Munich a few years ago. It was a different Arsenal that was late. That was a late Wenger. Or was it it Unai Emery? Was he there yet? Who was there? Who was the manager? Um, Can I see? Arsene Wenger, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that team in in 2017 when they got beaten 5-1. Lauren Koscielny, Shukran Mustafi, Aaron Ramsey, Oxlade Chamberlain. Theo Walcott played in that game. My God. Yeah, so that was a, a very different Arsenal, a very different Bayern Munich. Um, Arsenal have been incredible this season. Um, I saw them play against Brighton there at the weekend and just an com- incredibly commanding performance. They just look like they're growing into themselves, like they're... Um, I'm not doing much to to uh, kind of allay the rumors that I'm a a, a closet Arsenal fan. I, I swear I'm not. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to see this. Obviously, not the same Arsenal as lost five one to Bayern back in 2017, five one twice, lost ten two on aggregate. Um, but not the same Bayern Munich either. A very very different Bayern Munich. Thomas Tuchel has struggled uh, to get anything out of this team at all, apart from Harry Kane, um, who should have considerably more goals. Um, than he does have, but hasn't been really, I don't think, integrating well with the squad, or the squad haven't been uh, integrating well with him, I should say. Um, so yeah, very, very interesting to see how this goes tomorrow at the Emirates. I imagine Bayern will struggle to get away with a positive result. Um, the one thing they have in their favour is that the Bundesliga is over for them, and they got beaten by uh, Heidenheim, uh, who are in themselves a great story in, in Germany this year. They got beaten by Heidenheim. Um, and now only have the Champions League to play for. Arsenal, on the other hand, they're locked in a titanic title race um, with City and Liverpool in the Premier League. So, you know, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see. The other game is Real Madrid versus Manchester City. Um, we will let Enzo tell us what happens in that game. Uh, he will be in the City. Uh, we'll let him see what happens in that game. As we know, the last... Two times these teams have faced each other in the knockouts Champions League. They've gone on to win the competition, whoever comes out on top of that fixture. So that'll be an interesting one for sure. Um, we'll see if Haaland can get back to uh, back to scoring form at the crucial time. Uh, on Wednesday, we have Atletico Madrid versus Borussia Dortmund. Obviously, I'm an Atletico Madrid fan. Um, and I wish I was uh, confident here, but I just think that the kind of the amazing um, achievement of, of knocking out Inter, who were last year's finalists, obviously, um, in the fashion that Atletico did uh, when they got them back to the uh, Metropolitano in the round of 16. It's almost like, you know, the problem when you have a victory like that sometimes in a season or in a knockout or in a cup is that that can almost seem like that was the moment. And that was kind of the high point. That was the, that's what this campaign will be remembered for. And it's, 
how do you take a kind of an incredible comeback like that and say, okay, that's great, but now we're only in the quarterfinals and it's Dortmund and we should put them away pretty easily. You know, I don't want to see uh, Jaden Sancho and, you know, Julian Brandt and Karim Adeyemi looking like, you know, Neymar, uh, Suarez and Messi at the Metropolitano. And, but I have a feeling that I might, I have an even worse feeling about the return leg uh, at the Signal Iduna Park, but I won't even go into that right now. Uh, all I will say is that if you're uh, placing bets, I, I would not advise you to back Atletico to go through in this tie, even though all sense says they probably should. Um, also, we have PSG versus Barcelona. Um, Kylian Mbappe trying to sign off um, from PSG with a Champions League before he goes to Real Madrid in the summer. Luis Enrique trying to uh, build a, a post uh, post Mbappe uh, PSG, even as that other storyline is taking place. Um, Barcelona desperately in need of cash, <laughs> desperately in need of of, uh, of of qualification as far as they can go into this competition to get those five millions and ten millions uh, from UEFA, um, but also uh, completely lacking in players. Uh, I'm looking here: Pedri thigh injury, Gavi cruciate ligament injury, Frankie de Jong ankle injury, Andreas Christensen Achilles tendon in- injury, Alex Balde out for season as well. So it'll um, be very interesting to see who exactly plays on Wednesday um, for Barcelona. Meanwhile, for PSG. You have Akraf Hakimi is suspended for the game and Warren Zaire Emery is doubtful. So we might see Warren Zaire Emery might see Pedri and we won't see Gavi and we won't see Akraf Hakimi. Um, but that, I think, is going to be... That has the feeling because Mbappe has been taken off a few times over the last little while and there's kind of a bit going on. I think that has the the feeling of a, of a classic Mbappe performance against Barcelona. Uh, although you never know with Xavi's Barcelona, um, you just you just never know. You know, Joao Felix might uh, might decide to play. Um, Lewandowski might uh, you know terrorize uh, Marquinhos and company. Who knows? And um, but exciting nonetheless. Um, PSG only managed to draw um, the other night against Clermont. And they they played a heavily rotated team in the league because they they're running away with the title, and the I'm trying to think who it was. Oh, the Laharv manager, the Laharv manager came out afterwards, after the game, and said that PSG are making an absolute mockery of league on because they played such a heavily rotated team against Clermont, who were in a relegation battle. So are Laharv, but in the earlier part of the season when Laharv were playing them, they needed kind of to get points together and, and run away with the title. So the Harv had to play against, you know, all the heavy hitters, but Claremont got a soft touch and that this was ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And I just didn't think that really helped much water as an argument. Um, on Thursday, we have the Europa League and the Europa Conference League. AC Milan versus Roma in an all-Italian uh, quarterfinal. Uh, Ace Milan and uh, AS Roma. Um, I saw Roma in the uh, Derby della Capitale against Lazio. And they um they look good under De Rossi. They've got they've got fight, they've got bite, and um, but they also have some 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 really good patterns of play. And um, Pellegrini and Dybala and uh, Lukaku all looking good. Tammy Abraham is back. Uh, he he came back uh, there against Lazio the other, the other night. Um, but then Milan looked very good as well. Christian Pulisic looks excellent. Raphaelio starting to put us up about a bit. Ruben Loftus Cheek we know has been having a good season for them. Um, and Olivier Giroud, who I believe is going to the MLS, he signed with LA FC, was it? Going to join his uh, compatriot Hugo Lloris. Does he play for LA FC? I don't know. I'm not wearing my LA hat uh, tonight, so I don't know. Uh, Bayer Leverkusen, the mighty Bayer Leverkusen, only one uh, win away from the Bundesliga title, I believe. Is that right? Um, they're taking on David Moyes, West Ham. Um, and so we'll have to see how that goes for West Ham. Uh, Leverkusen won't walk that game. They've had to come back, I think, in consecutive uh, Europa League fixtures. Um, but they always seem to do it. They always seem to have a, a goal in them. I saw a crazy statistic that like Patrick Schick um, has scored goals only after the 85th minute or only winners or only equalizers after the 85th minute or something for them. So they've been finding goals from all over the pitch. 
Uh, if you haven't seen much of Bayer Leverkusen, this game against West Ham will be uh, one to watch. Uh, Frimpong on the right and Grimaldo on the left. I can't believe Grimaldo was was able to go to uh, Leverkusen from from Benfica like that. That was mad. Someone should have picked him up. He's excellent. Um, I believe Victor Boniface is back in the squad as well. Um, so that'll be that'll be obviously unless you're a fan of one of the other teams, I'd be kind of thinking Bayer Leverkusen versus West Ham to watch on Thursday night. Um, Enzo's not here again, so I can say that because he's not going to mind about the the uh, recommendation against watching AC Milan. Um, Benfica versus Marseille. Who knows how that could go? Those two teams have had kind of spotty records this season, and um, Benfica, um, had a game against uh Sporting uh Lisbon the other night, and uh lost it two one. Thanks to a ninety first minute from Katamo, uh, Gaini Katamo. From Mozambique, the 23-year-old uh, for Sporting Lisbon scored a brace. He scored in the first minute and he scored in the 91st minute, which is I always love that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, he's he's um, a 23-year-old, uh, five goals and three assists in 14 starts this season for uh, Sporting Club de Portugal. He put a he put a dent in the in, in Benfica's hopes for the title. Um, Sporting CP are now uh, well ahead after that big six-pointer at the top of the the top of the um the what do you call it the uh, liga portugal um yeah victor jocarez as well was playing for for sporting lisbon the other night and victor jocarez is 25 but if you remember his stats for coventry last season and you look at his stats for sporting lisbon now i don't believe they're going to have it next season surely someone's going to come in and spend 100 million on victor jocarez um, and he doesn't have any cards i don't think because he's been playing uh, he was a brighton player um, on loan a few places, including Coventry. I think we're going to get Victor Jokovic's rookie cards. I hope we do. Um, and obviously, there might not be a huge clamor for them. Um, but if he hasn't had any cards up to this point, and he then goes on to have a, you know, he's kind of just hitting his goal-scoring prime now if he follows the kind of classic striker pattern, uh, maybe could be a good one to keep keep an eye on. Um, Marseille, how are Marseille doing? Let me just double-check here. They got beaten 3-1 by Lille. Um. Yeah, they were on a good run for a while because they got a new, they got a new manager. They got uh, a caretaker manager in who I believe was the manager of the Ivory, the Ivory Coast sacked after the group stage of Afcon. I can't remember his name. And um, they were putting on together a good run there for a while, shooting up the table, and then they got beaten by uh, Villarreal, Rennes, PSG, and Lille all in a row uh, in the Europa League and in Ligue 1. And it's not going to get any easier. When they travel uh, to the uh, Estadio de Sport de Lisboa e Benfica, aka the Estadio de Luz in Lisbon. Um, so yeah, that'll be kind of a real Europa League, a Europa League heavyweight clash. Can you have a can you have a heavyweight clash in the Europa League, a middleweight clash? And then Liverpool, who are um, a lot of people's favourites for the competition, are playing host to Atalanta at Anfield. But like we talked about with Arsenal. They're preoccupied at the minute. So we're interested to see what kind of team they put out. Um, let me see. Conference League to finish up. What have we got in the Conference League? Olympiacos, Fenerbahce. Oh, Greece, Turkey. Always fiery. Uh, Victoria Pilsen versus Fiorentina. Um, tough place to go. The Czech Republic. Uh, Aston Villa versus Lille. Jonathan David Masterclass. Ollie Watkins Masterclass. Hmm. And Club Bruges or Club Brugge versus Pauk Thessaloniki FC. I can honestly say... I don't know how either of those teams are doing recently. Uh, let's see. Club Brews just beat Anderlecht the other day uh, with one goal from Brandon Michele and two goals from Raphael Onyedika, uh, who has two goals and two starts. Oh, this is a playoff. Ch- oh, Belgium's so difficult to look at stats for because they break their season up into a million little pieces. Um, haven't heard much from Antonio Nusa recently. Um, but would love to would love to see how he gets on um, in this game because he seems to be putting in good performances from what I hear and creating a lot of chances, a lot of good runs, stuff like that. Uh, where are Brugge in the Belgian? Right. They're in the playoff championship group, five points behind joint leaders Union saint gilloise and Andelect. Okay, and how are Pauk in Greece? The top of the the top of the table. They're ahead of AK Athens, Panathinaikos, and Olympiakos. So, interesting one. 
there as well. But I think on Thursday night, is there any early matches? I love when there's an early match. A double a double bill of European football. That's what I like. Oh, it's Fenerbahce and Victoria Pilsen. So Fenerbahce and Olympiacos and Victoria Pilsen, Fiorentina are the early games. So I think Olympiacos versus Fenerbahce, followed by Leverkusen and West Ham. That'll be my uh, recommendation uh, for a bit of Thursday night viewing. Champions League, I'll leave it completely up to you. It's your discretion what you watch. Anyway, we're back on Thursday with Enzo. Um, no more of this bloody ridiculousness, me just rambling on to myself in this horrible heart. Seriously, for the listeners, the light is just awful. I feel like, ah. Um, yeah, so this this is just about um, finished. Back on Thursday, Enzo's back. He can tell us all about how he got on in Madrid. We'll talk about the results of the Champions League. We'll talk about any card news that comes out in the meantime. Um, yes, thank you for listening. We never say thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching from me personally because I had to do this one uh, solo. So, um, yes, have a good week and we'll see you on Thursday. Thursday.